Terry Podcast, where we help faith-driven founders, entrepreneurs, and executives tell the stories that matter. We got a story that matters big time today, and I'm glad to be back behind the mic again once again with my friend and business partner, Jason Todd. Jason, how are you, my friend? I'm doing well, Paul. I'm excited to be here because we're telling a story that is very personal. Some authors talk about business and task management, time management. Uh, but in this case, we got a personal story of struggle and hope. And I think also something very fascinating is uh, a husband and wife who have authored together. So welcome to the podcast, uh, Craig and Karen, you've written a book. Walk us through the title of that book and why it was so important for you to write that. Well, first, Paul, Jason, thank you for having us. We've been really looking forward to this discussion. And, you know, I think, so a little bit of context, um, August, starting in August of 2021, I began a three month journey in the hospital, uh, which the experts expected would end much shorter and not in a good way. Mm -hmm. And the, um, yeah, and when I got out of the hospital, um, basically I had to learn how to do everything again, learn how to walk, et cetera. And we would, we had been dealing with a number of feelings and emotions, um, uh, from that, you know, and kind of post-processing and, and one morning we were at church and we were part of the prayer team and Karen noticed this lady that had come up and was by herself. She was crying and praying by herself and Karen went up to her and said, can I pray for you? And she just breaks out in tears and she says, I feel so guilty. My husband died of COVID. He died alone. This happened two years ago and I just can't forgive myself. Hmm. And it was when we were driving home from church that day, that's when we said, you know what, we need to go ahead and write this. We, we'd been debating, but we were like, we need to write this because it was COVID that nearly took me. And, um, we both wrestled with guilt, you know, mm -hmm. different types of guilt, you know, and it's, and let, let me say this from the front end, there, there certainly somebody that's listening that lost somebody to COVID and we both, um, we both want to say how deeply sorry we are. And the many look at us as, well, you guys won the prize. You got to live. Well, that didn't absolve us of guilt. You know, we mm -hmm. both walked away wrestling with that unique, you know, me a little bit more survivor's guilt, Karen more of wrestling with decisions she made on my behalf while I was, I was out. And, and so I think whatever your journey with COVID is, it's you've probably had some guilt. And we wrote this book for you and we want you to live a life free of guilt. Mm. Jason, you're muted. You're, you were saying something. And you've got a copy of that book there with you. Uh, we do right here. Hope that won't die. Yeah. Tell it's me about the cover. So the, and the publisher gave me a few concepts and he asked me what to, uh, what to do. And, and you know, the original title of the book was something about, you know, life in the shadows or surviving the shadows, or, you know, we were playing around with different things around, uh, you know, though I walk through the shadow of the Valley of death, you know, I have fear, no evil. And so it was from that perspective that he brought in this, this hand, but when we changed the title, which was happening about the same time the cover art was being developed, I really liked this because it symbolized, you know, Karen was reaching out to me in the real world and, you know, and, and in many ways I was, you know, reaching for her in the world I was living in, which was some sort of transient state that you know, I loosely describe as dreams and I call it dreams only because I don't have a better word to describe where I was residing during that time. 
Mm. That's so interesting. And the reason I ask about the cover, not only so people can see what the cover looks like when they go to, to purchase your book, but this idea of hope and death all in one. I like the shadow on that because hope is, it's like a shadow. Mm. It, it's only there in the context of something that we are currently experiencing. Mm. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. And the, you know, and the, the interesting thing, the, when I was on the ventilator, so what, let me back up, let me give a little bit more context so everybody can know what happened. I went in the hospital on August 10th, 2021. And, uh, Karen dropped me off at the front door and then she immediately came in. But by the time she came in, they had already taken me back. I could hear her. I was on the other side of a, a curtain and she said, well, where's my husband? They said, we have him. You need to leave. This was COVID. They weren't letting family in the hospital. Mm. And, you know, little did I know it would be another two months before I'd see her. And uh, another month before she'd see me hmm. and, um, and they made her leave. She sat out in the parking lot for, is it three hours? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. We were texting back and forth. And eventually I said, you know, you should probably just go home because they were originally going to try to release me, give me some oxygen, send me home until they realized, nope, we, we can't give them enough oxygen. And. And so I spent, uh, 11 days on the ventilator or 11 days kind of fighting on my own. <laughs> and on the evening of August 21st, 2021, uh, they gave me a heavy dose of morphine, uh, which kind of knocked me out, but apparently no morphine also suppresses respiration mm. and everything I'd been doing up to that was I was hooked to a pulse oximeter measuring my oxygen level. And if it dropped below 86%, an alarm went off and I immediately had to go start doing some exercises to bring my oxygen level back up. And I'd been successfully doing that for 11 days until they hit me full of morphine. And then she got a phone call at 1230 in the morning. And, um, Tell them about that phone call. Well, I was sound asleep and didn't realize that this was coming. And they called me and said that um, the doctor just said he's not doing well. Um, we've got to put him on the ventilator. And I said, he doesn't want to be on a ventilator. And um, he said, well, he laughed at me. And he said, if we don't put him on a ventilator, he'll be dead within 24 hours. Mm. And they said he wasn't coherent enough to make any decisions. Um, but they talked to him. I could hear it on the phone and he was screaming, no ventilator, no ventilator. But they scared me to death, you know, saying he wouldn't be. And so I said to him, how many survivors have you had on the ventilator? And they said none. And so I'm left with just an impossible, uh, an impossible situation, you know, an impossible uh, thing. But I just, I couldn't say no, uh, you know. They said, you know, this, it'll at least give him a 4% chance. And mm. so I had to, as much as I knew he didn't want to be on that ventilator, I didn't know what else to do. And so I gave him permission to put him on the ventilator. Wow. wow. And then what followed that was, you know, she had been updating friends and family via text message and that just was too burdensome. So she started, somebody said, why don't you use caring bridge? And it's a way of updating friends and family of what was going on. And so she started a daily journal there and Jason, back to your question about hope. When you read that journal, she was walking an interesting line, you know, the living with the reality that I would almost certainly die. But while walking every day into that hospital with that reality, she had to deal with is God good. If God takes Craig, is he still good? No. Yeah. And it was five weeks before a doctor finally told her, I think your husband will live. Mm. And we knew a lot of friends and other people that weren't believers were reading this. 
And to me, it was super important that they understand that even if God took credit home, he was good. And mm. I, so I was really, I felt so burdened about that of, you know, I wanted to be honest and, and authentic in what I was saying and what we were going through, but I wanted them to know that God was good no matter what. Yeah. Mm. Right. The story. Yeah. More, more than I had even seen on the surface and immediately what I'm thinking of is, uh, exactly that is, you know, all this is going on and you can't go in, I assume you can't, I mean, you can't go in and for, <laughs> for a while. Well, that, that I, was their first answer. Yeah. I, I, when he went on the ventilator and we couldn't communicate anymore, I fought my way in. I just. I, I told the hospital, you can't keep me away. Um, yeah. I said, you're telling me he's going to die. You just can't. And so they did let me in one hour a day. And that helped get the policies changed for all those other families in the, in the ICU. Oh. They started, a couple of weeks later, they started letting those families in too. Because, you know, I think that's one of the keys with Craig is even in his coma, he heard me. Yeah. He heard what I said. And I think a lot of people died because they were alone and they thought they'd been abandoned. And so that was another thing with this book. I, you know, I wanted to, I kind of wanted to make sure everybody knew how important that was, that you just can't keep your families away, no. um, you know, in this situation. Yeah. When there's, um, I learned a little something about that, uh, when my, when my dad passed away because he was still alive, but you know, he was on oxygen and, you know, couldn't, couldn't interact with me. Mm -hmm. uh, but a friend of mine told me, you know, one of the best things you can say to somebody, if you know that like, and in his case, we knew he was going to die. Um, the, one of the best things you can say to them is, uh, it's okay. We're going to be okay. You, you, I know you, I know how important we are to you and you want to stick around and make sure we're okay. We're going to be fine. You can go. Mm. Not that you should have said that, Karen. Yeah. <laughs> right. I wanted to <laughs> but one way or another, right, right. Uh, the soul still lives and the soul still hears. That's right. That. And the hearing is according to, to, to establish medical practice, as far as I know, is one of the final senses to go. That's right. And, um, so I, you know. I spent the last several hours of my dad's life, uh, reading various poetry, you know, um, he was an atheist, but he couldn't stop me because he couldn't talk. So I prayed over him anyway, out loud and said, too bad. You want to be with me in the, your last hours? You're gonna have to listen to me pray. Like that. And, uh, so, um, so anyway, you know, it's, I, uh, but I, I was thinking of that and you know, if Craig was on a ventilator, the importance the importance of still communicating with the soul. And then on top of that, still communicating with all the souls that are connected to these events, um, through the, what was it? You said the, the medical bridge, what was it? The oh, caring bridge, bridge. Caring, yeah. bridge. Caring, yeah. caring bridge. The, uh, on top of that, the importance of communicating regularly and communicating in the transparent way that you did there. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's the, the essence of spreading hope. Yeah. And it's, you know, when I was in my coma, I had a, a, a series of dream, uh, dreams. And if you think of it as a continuum on the, at the time where it was lights out for me, the dreams were very disconnected from reality. I was driving Michael Jordan's Ferrari. I was driving some other cars, almost, uh, almost got prosecuted for grand theft auto. Um, for joy riding a Bentley and yes, yeah, so that's how they started. If you go to the other side of the continuum, the dreams were very tightly tied to reality and then everything in between, it just started moving in the direction of reality mm. and the, you know, and the thing that was interesting is when I woke up. My view of doctors had changed in a very negative way. And my view of Karen had changed in a very positive way. Mm. And I would say, let me change view with trust. My trust in the doctors had dropped significantly while my trust in Karen went through the roof. And 
what was happening in my dreams was um, the doctors were doing strange things. I didn't trust them. Uh, sometimes they were sort of shadows that were moving around me. Mm-hmm. Uh, in one dream, um, that I told Karen about somewhat recently, it was it, what was happening in the real world was I was struggling breathing. They had, they had just taken me off the ventilator. And the doctor comes in and uh, got kind of snippety and ugly. He was like, you know, he was asking if I wanted to go back on the ventilator. He said, it looks like you're struggling breathing. Why don't we put you back on the ventilator? Well, I I couldn't talk. I had a trach. So even if I wanted to talk, I couldn't talk. But I was, you know, not coherent. And Karen and I, uh, Karen and the doctor had a back and forth. And that showed up in my world in a slightly different way. But I just remember it being, um, remember him being unkind Mm -hmm. and, you know, there were a number of, um, number of dreams like that. And, um, but there was, you know, there was one dream. This was really interesting. These dreams were my reality. And again, I use the term dream loosely just because I don't have a better term for it. But when I woke up, I just assumed that was reality. And I started noticing, you know, I would say something and people would look at me weird. And uh, I started realizing what they believe about reality is different than what I believe about reality. Yeah. And the time it became crystal clear was when my brother uh, was visiting me and I was awake at this point and, um, I had had the trach removed and I could talk and he, um, he started talking about his last visit to my house. Well, in my world, he had never been to my house. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'd forgotten about my house of 17 years. And my first thought was you haven't been there, but I was like, if I say that, they're going to think I'm nuts. And if they think I'm nuts, they're going to take away privileges. Yeah. So I said, well, Brent, tell me about the last time you went to my house. He said, oh, it was last month. It, it, um, I said, when was last time? He said, last month when you were on the ventilator. And I said, well, tell me about your visit. And I got him to describe my house to me without telling him, you know, what I was really believing. And as he talked about it, I started remembering my house again of 17 years. Yeah. And it was a day or two later that I, I said, Karen, um, I'm going to tell you some things. I need you to tell me what's true and what's not. Yeah. And, uh, I asked her, I said, have we been to Louisiana? And she said, no, no. I'm like, really? And so I started telling her, I said, well, in my world, I'd gone to a resort in Louisiana. Um, didn't realize Louisiana had resorts, but apparently in my world, they did. <laughs> and, uh, and I said in this resort, they had interest in room service where I could dial in room service and some young lady would come in and spray raw cow's milk at my face and it felt good. So as soon as she was gone, I hit redial, bring back some more of that raw cow's milk. I mean, I just went all the raw cow's milk I could get because when they'd spray it in my face, it'd make me feel better. Well, eventually it came time for me to leave the resort and they come in on the speaker in the room and say, Mr. Andrews, you need to leave. And I said, well, I can't move. So this is where this was the reality. I could not move. Right. And, and they started getting upset and kept getting upset. And, uh, they said, if you don't leave, we'll tell your wife about your room service. And I said, you can tell her she knows I like raw cow's milk. No secrets there. By the way, I'd never had raw cow's milk in my life at this point. And Especially not sprayed all over your face. That's kind of an odd yeah. way to consume it. <laughs> yeah, but it felt good. And, <laughs> uh, and eventually I heard them mumbling. And really, I was, I, as they were getting upset, I thought, well, maybe if I can roll out of bed and fall on the floor, somebody will at least have to come in and pick me up. And so I was trying to do that. And eventually I heard the mumbling. They said, well, let's bring in his wife. And Karen came in and she put her hand on my left shoulder and she said, Craig, this is Karen. I'm your wife. It's going to be okay. Hmm. When I told Karen that she said, 
I said those exact words to you in your coma. Mm. Yeah. And the raw cow's milk turns out, once we put two and two together, it was the albuterol that they were spraying through his ventilator a couple of times a day. And so it was funny how his dreams did connect. They just, it was just his mind trying to make sense of what was going on around him. So at that point I had the trach, were they doing it in the ventilator or were they putting a mask on my face? Mask on your face. Yeah. So little mask on my face, you know, was interpret. Yeah. My brain just interpreted that. And by the way, the respiratory techs that were doing that were usually young ladies. And, and so my brain just interpreted that as raw cow's milk. Yeah. So it's, this is a couple of years. We're, we're now in t- 2024. It's been a couple of years since this yeah. experience. Uh, writing a book is a pretty big undertaking. Writing a book with somebody else, particularly a spouse, I think is, is uh, it's unique. Um, t- when did you decide that this must be a book and you're going to write it together? And when we saw people hurting and searching for answers, that's when we felt like we had to write it. And that was, that was 2022. That was fall of 2022. You know what that makes me think of is, uh, back to the, the story of, um, you interpreting the albuterol as cow's milk. And I think. What's beneficial about this is that people who are experiencing the same kind of whatever, whatever it is, survivor's guilt or guilt over bad, uh, over decisions that they made or that they perceive one way, or, you know, I think they're, they're having a similar reaction except in the reverse because you were, you were out there in the spiritual world, right? And so what's happening to your body, your brain doesn't interpret it properly because you're you know, you're in the, the Hebrews call it the Shemaim, right? The invisible world. Mm-hmm. And so you, there's a lot more latitude in that world as to what these stimuli can be. Mm-hmm. Um, but in, in, in the case of people that you see who are hurting, they're in the physical world, the natural world, which, uh, which sets certain parameters, especially because of our, um, culture that rejects the spiritual right it sets certain parameters on what could be happening to them Mm -hmm. as a result of those you know those things that they went through or the decisions they made and so you're opening up the universe for them by writing this book is what i is what i perceive because you're saying to them no which is something that a lot of our authors spend a lot of time doing right it's saying look i know this happened I know you went through this. I know this is what the world says about it, but they have blinders on. They can't see. Mm. And let's open up the door. Let's pull back the curtain here and consider some of the broader applications of what you've actually been through and what that means for you and the people around you in your circle. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, Steve Jobs said the most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. And I think for anybody who's thinking about writing a book, if you have a message that you think people need to hear, what they need is not a textbook. They need a story that kind of draws them in and leads them to a, leads them to the destination that you think would serve them best. And that's very much what we tried to do in, in this book, you know, from the onset, the strategy was, you know, the book comes in three sections. Section one is Craig's journey, which is me telling the story up until it was lights out for me. Mm -hmm. Section two is Karen's journey. And she steps back a few days to the day I walked into the hospital and tells the story from her perspective from that day all the way until I leave the hospital. Our strategy was to have, you know, to deeply connect with the reader in those two sections to create a lot of emotional bonds, empathy, and connection. And then section three is lessons from the journey. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's where we're delivering the message that really matters most to us. 
Yeah. And that, <laughs> that's really the, you know, that's something that we emphasize to authors, right? Your story is unique. In fact, it can be in the case of a, a married couple, right? It can be multifaceted because there's a whole, there's, there's another person watching, going through the same thing, but having a similar, but different reaction mm -hmm. to it. And, and then there are those things, right. That, that, that are common to all human beings, which if, if we can identify them as they pop up in the story, then we can say to a reader, you don't have to be going through what I went through to access the same unbending, unchanging truth. You only have to be going through your story and develop the ability to see it when it's in front of you to know, okay, then I've got to, I've got to do this differently, or I've got to start doing this because I haven't done it because I remember what I read in that book that was so powerful and moving to me. So mm -hmm. I, I applaud that. I think that's the right thing to do to put it in that order. Mm. Yeah. Well, and we used a lot of my caring bridge journals because I was, I was writing day by day and, um, it was, it was kind of raw and unfiltered and Craig didn't even want, I was really, really tired and under a great deal of stress. So there were times my grammar wasn't correct or I made some misspellings and Craig didn't want any of that changed because, um, you know, that kind of was the rawness of what we were going through. And so a lot of my writing is that journal. And, um, you know, I didn't realize at the time I was writing a book and that's probably the best thing <laughs> is that it was just kind of raw and unfiltered. I yeah. wanted the world to know she called me it. <laughs> There's one point. One of her journal injuries says it slept most of the day. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's interesting looking into the process of writing a book because there are multiple ways to come about a book. Uh, and, and you using your caring bridge journals, which were designed to keep everybody uh, probably to process what was happening for yourself, but also to make it available to the, the folks who care. Uh, it seems like it's a natural extension into unpacking that after the fact, after the dust has settled, we have an opportunity to, to, uh, have the lessons learned. You know, you never, you don't process the left lessons learned in the moment. You always right. have, you know, you process them, the, them after the fact, what was it like for you as you're going through those journals and then turning them into a book? Well, for me, you know, going back, it was. You know, I'm so glad I did them just for, you know, you forget things and, and you, you lose over time, you lose even some of the emotion of it and whatever. So for me, it was just so good to have that. And as I go back and I can remember what that felt like and what that was like and, and, you know, and then it helped Craig and I as he was waking up and processing because we had both, you know, gone through the same experience, but totally differently. And it was really helpful for us to be able to process uh, through that. So he could read my journal and see, you know, what I was feeling and what I was thinking. And he could ask, you know, questions. And and that's how we put a lot of his dreams together with what was actually happening and things like that. But it just um, it just made sense that that would be part of the book because that just tells the the real raw story of, you know, of that time when they said he was not going to survive mm -hmm. and, you know, and what all that looked like. I'm so glad. Go ahead, Craig. You, it looks like you're going to say something. Yeah. And, you know, just two quick thoughts. One, of the re just to drive home this point of clarity, I didn't want her journal entries edited because part of the story was the spelling errors, the grammar errors, you know, just seeing that emotional distress brought out in the writing. And I felt if we sanitized that, it would take part of the story away. Mm. But the other thing that's really interesting to see, because <clears throat> it's there, it's locked in on September 12th, 2021. You know, the nurse comes in and at this point they were trying to wake me up. You know, it's, they were trying to get me off the ventilator. I was still in the ventilator. I was on trach at that time. And the nurse walks into the room and Karen asked the nurse, 
is he waking up? And the nurse responded, no, and he may not. Mm -hmm. And in the journal, Karen says at that point, I put my hands over Craig and kind of lifted him up to heaven mm -hmm. and said, God, you love him more than I ever could. Please do what's best. Mm -hmm. That's not a, you know, that's not some memory that's been shaped and evolved over time that was captured real time in that moment and it i don't know for me it's just valuable to see that and for me one of the not one of the most encouraging things for me was seeing the steadfastness of karen's faith when everybody around her was telling her I was, I was gone. Mm. Well, we really did see the God's goodness through the whole thing, even, even in the worst of days. And there were some really hard days. Yeah. God truly was good. And, and he was holding all of us up. It's a remarkable testimony to the power, I think of, of your relationship and the context of marital relationships in general, when we see it exposed in this idea, you know, Craig, you, you're going through this hidden experience. No one else can see what you're seeing, experiencing what you're experiencing. Your brain's putting together stories that, uh, based on facts that you are unaware of. <laughs> and, you know, Karen, you're watching all of this unfold in, I can imagine a bit of a helpless state. You're, you're at the mercy it seems of, you know, of doctors who think they know what they're doing, uh, and, and are probably doing their best. And then to have the, the resolution of all of this in the context of writing a book so that you can both put your experiences out on the table, uh, and, and reconnect, uh, what how did this, how did re reconnection and writing this book change your relationship? Mm. Well, it, you know, it, it, well, it most definitely brought us closer, most mm. definitely brought us closer. And it, it, it has been so amazing for both of us because he's had some survivor guilt. I felt guilty for all the decisions that I made, you know, I was doing the best I could with what I had. But looking back, it's like, I wish I had done some things differently. But as we're, we're, as we're looking at this together and as we're putting this all together in this book, it just, it made us appreciate each other so much more. You know, I think he saw my level of care and he, he was so good to say, you did the best you could with what you had, you know, yeah. and it was, it was just, it was very healing, I think, for both of us, wouldn't you say? Yeah, absolutely. And. And, and, you know, for anybody that is wrestling with decisions they made for their loved one, you know, I, here's something I'd love to share. When I, you know, so I was six weeks in the coma and then for a week or two after I woke up, my mind was still a little goofy. And when my mind started clearing, Karen told me about what had happened. And she told me about that night she got the call at 1230 in the morning. And the feeling that overwhelmed me at that point was profound sadness for the position those doctors put her in. Yeah. What, and, and we've talked to others and it turns out most people who got that phone call, got it in the middle of the night when they weren't thinking clearly, most of them were pressured to do things. Karen got pressured to. Uh, put a DNR in place and that's something, uh, do not resuscitate. And that's something yeah. that <clears throat> is a common thread. And, and so for anybody that's listening and, and took that phone call, um, I think you probably made the best decision you could with the information you had. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's, you know, you, we can, we can discuss it and debate it, but when you don't know and you have to make, you know, you're, you're into this 
and, and there's all that pressure being brought to bear and it's life or death. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, <clears throat> I think it's a good idea to err on the side of grace with things like that. And, you know, just loosely, as I think about, uh, friends of mine from the military, right. Who had to make a life or death decision to pull a trigger mm -hmm. and, yeah. pulled, and pulled one and somebody died and it wasn't the person they intended to kill. Mm -hmm. It was no one they would ever have dreamed of setting out to kill, but had they not done it, even more people would have died. And what do you do with that? Right? Well, you, the best thing you can do is err on the side of grace. Um, make no excuses or, you know, don't try to blame it on anyone else. You know, you, yes, that happened, but ultimately, um, it's a good thing. None of us are the judge mm -hmm. in the eternal sense. And the judge is merciful. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So as we're closing out our time on this podcast, I'm curious that you've got this book, a life-changing experience written down, uh, that's brought you together in a new way which has got to be pretty incredible. I can imagine what, what do you use the book for? How do you use that in, in your life? Well, we're trying to use uh, hope that won't die as a way of reaching out to the hurting. The, you know, we'll give you a little hint on what the hope is. The, the only hope that won't die is hope that's placed in, in Jesus Christ. And and so as, as people look at that, you know, and, and let me just be blunt. I think people send horribly. They send against Karen. They send against me. They send against a lot of people that died and didn't need to die. And, <clears throat> and that's what happens when people put their hope in anything but Christ. And so what I hope is that this book turns hearts towards God. Um, I think we made some horrible mistakes during the pandemic, mistakes that were avoidable. And so I hope that people look at that and, and seriously say, wait a minute, did we make the right decisions here? And, and did we, did we blow by some safeguards that were in the system? Did we tear down some safeguards that should stop some behavior that we somehow justified during the pandemic because it was quote unprecedented times. Yeah. And so, you know, we need a reminder every now and then, uh, sadly, we need a reminder of why we have ethical standards in place, why why we do certain things that we do and we need these reminders for the next time of crisis when it's easy to say well wait a minute this is unprecedented well it's not unprecedented you know we've had prior pandemics we've there, there's truly you know the bible says there's nothing new under the sun mm -hmm. you know maybe it looked a little different before but it's not unprecedented and so we hope it changes hearts in that way mm. Yeah, that, uh, it was about as unprecedented as the sun coming up Yeah, <laughs> for me watching that whole thing. I'm like, I've seen this before Yeah, mass hysteria, right? How many times has there been mass hysteria in my life? I've lost count, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, there is no, there is no cure for it. So, but I can't live in fear of it. That's, you know, that's living in a vacuum. That's right. And, um, of course, nobody listened to me either at that time. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, Paul, you, you have a military training as well. Right. And, you know, the way we were trained was we practice for the day that we have to make these tough decisions. Yeah. You know, and, you know, of course, I'm a, a Marine and we, we're very proud of our marksmanship and the you know, and the training is to take that slow, well-aimed shot when all hell is breaking loose around you. 
Yeah. Because that's the thing that's going to keep you alive. Right. Yeah. Steady position, aim, breathe, trigger squeeze. Yeah. Well, this has definitely been one for the ages <laughs> on the Emissary Authors Podcasts, chatting with Craig and Karen Andrews about their book, Hope That Won't Die, co-authored in the aftermath of Craig's uh, life and death cage match with COVID-19. Uh, Craig and Karen, is there anywhere online we should send people if they want to learn more about you or the book? So there's a website, hope that won't die.com. And there's a link from that website that will take them to Amazon. If they want to buy a copy of the book, uh, the introduction of the book is on, on the website and fairly confident. If you read that introduction, be one of the wildest things that you read this week, <laughs> about an eight minute read and it will take you for a ride. That's a great intro. If you read this, it's going to be the wildest thing you're going to read all week. Yeah. Well, that makes me want to go there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well done. Uh, it's not your first book, Craig. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that if people research you, they'll find both of your books uh, now. So congratulations on writing this. I think it, I, I don't say it lightly. I think it's incredible that you uh, chose to um, put an end cap on this experience by writing it together. Yeah. I think that's a, a powerful way to to bring two people together and also a powerful way to communicate uh, the experiences of life that that uh, not only for COVID, but all all the other things, all the other challenges that people might go through. Uh, when you go with, go through it with with someone, um, uh, maybe evaluate it with someone and consider writing a book together. Mm -hmm. I love it. Thank you. And, and I think one lesson from our journey is if, if you write a little bit every day, at some point you're going to realize you have a book. <laughs> That's very true. That's all right. <laughs> well, Craig, Karen, thanks so much for, uh, joining us for pulling back the, pulling back the curtain and sharing all about the background and the context and what led to you writing this book. Uh, we would love to have you again sometime on the podcast. Meantime, my name is Paul Edwards. This is Jason Todd. We're signing off for the Emissary Authors Podcast, and we'll see you on the next episode. <laughs>